as you guys have been seeing in the prior sessions with big data exploding, everyone's now trying to make sense of all this data. And one of the hardest positions to hire now is data scientists. I'll tell you this from personal experience. So we have a very topical fireside chat today with Anika Jimenez, who heads uh, Pivotal's Global uh, Data Science Lab, and uh, Yuko Yamazaki from Zynga, GM of Analytics at Zynga, would be the moderator for this one. Thanks. Uh, so I'd like to get started by asking you guys, if you don't mind, if uh, uh, how many of you guys are data scientists? <laughs> yeah, okay. There's one. Quick, everybody There's go one, hire him. Three. <laughs> uh, and how many of you guys are working or studying analytics or machine learning field? Okay. Cool. So the very first question, Anika, might be a little silly question to some of you guys, but what is data scientist? And what kind <laughs> of uh, roles or responsibility do you look for when you're hiring data scientists? Sure, yeah, so I think I'm actually gonna take a step back and define data science, right? And then we'll decompose that a little bit into what a data scientist actually is, the person who, who practices data science. Um, and I found um, when I engage with our customers at Pivotal, um, I actually find that that's a really important starting point because a lot of times they'll come to um, the conversation with um, a lot of data baggage um, that is tied to failed BI related efforts. Um, and so the first thing we try to do is start off the conversation with that definition. So we, um, from my perspective, data science is um, the use of statistical and machine learning techniques on big, multivaried data um, in a distributed computing environment. Right? And then you can do whatever you want at that point. You can um, look for a causal or a correlation. You can classify, categorize events. You can do whatever it is that you're wanting to do. Um, there's a whole why that should be asked, why you do data science um, that we can talk about, but um, that for us is the what. Uh, and, you, and you can, um, by inference there, then decompose that into um, uh, what a data scientist would be, right? So for us, like I said, we kind of draw a high bar for what data science is, meaning I've specifically said it needed to be um, big data, um, it needs to be uh, of a uh, kind of varied um, degree of variety, so it can be unstructured, it can be semi-structured, et cetera. Um, and then we're doing sophisticated things with it. We're actually not just aggregating it up into um, measures and reporting it through a BI layer. We're actually um, trying to apply more sophisticated um, processing at the algorithm level against the data. And then we're doing that, we're leveraging a distributed compute stack in order to do that very fast. So that could be Hadoop, it can be MPP, relational database, it could be whatever. Um, but all those things together are, for me, what makes data science. Right? So um, that means we're looking for people who are, um, when we say that we're hiring data scientists, we're looking for people that um, both have very strong knowledge in stats and math, and then also are bringing together uh, kind of a foundational set of skills in programming, mm -hmm. right? Um, not to mention the other things that people always ask about, which is domain knowledge, in some cases, communication skills, te additional technical knowledge, et cetera. So, but for us, those core vectors are the things that we're looking for strength in, programming and stats. Cool. One thing I want to add to that that I've noticed at Zynga is it's not only that they can build and predict and forecast, but also be able to actually um, um, identify opportunities. So knowing the product and be able to say, this is where we think machine learning is going to be able to help you. And not only that, but also able to explain to product managers, GMs, who are not really machine learning data science uh, oriented folks. Um, so those are the two another additional areas that I will look as well. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, so we're, yeah. we always emphasize communications, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to convert complex concepts into a business to a business audience, um, and that's definitely important. Um, I think if you again, if you go back to um, kind of the original question, like what's the output of data science? Um, it's actually, from our perspective, um, usually a model as represented with code, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the intent is to actually take that model and put it into production, in a production data environment, um, like the one that Pivotal provides, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then enable actioning against the scored output of that model, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really what a data, science is driving, data scientist is driving. 
um, versus the output of other efforts like um, analysis, which is to yield insights that informs decision making. It's mm -hmm. a different um, focus. Okay. Now, how do you uh, structure the organization? So you've got the data scientists, now the company, to be able to leverage that the most and be able to take the best out of them. How would you structure the organization? Yeah, so um, this is also another common question. Um, so whether or not uh, you're hiring data scientists to help build competitive differentiation into your product or um, you know, you're actually building a, a company a r fundamentally attached to data, right? Um, I think that the, the key is to uh, move beyond what is typically kind of emerging out of the enterprise class, which is a siloed approach to data, right? So a lot of times what we find is um, uh, data science has emerged kind of as a grassroots um, element coming out of many business units. Uh, and that has led to a scenario where uh, analytics as a whole is kind of sitting in many different business units and that causes all sorts of problems. Um, so, you know, prior to Pivotal and my time at Greenplum, I was at Yahoo for a long time and if any of you know Yahoo, we had our organizational challenges. <laughs> um, and uh, I saw both sides of the, uh, the hat um, and I am a strong advocate for centralized analytics, so um, that's probably the first key piece mm -hmm. of advice. I strongly agree with that too. I think central <laughs> analytics just not only helps just to do the knowledge sharing and yes, success across product teams, but it really um, creates the culture. And one, another thing to add to that that we've done at Zynga that I believe has created the data-driven culture is what we call embedded structure. I don't know if you guys yeah. do that as well. We call it hybrid. Hybrid. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yes. yeah, so in essence you're saying you have dedicated people that sit with the central team. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, it could be maybe opposite of in terms of the structure, maybe I might yeah. be wrong, but uh, so the way we do it is uh, if we have 20 product teams, we have 20 data analysts uh, to start with, not the data scientists yet, but um, and they basically sit with product team and they're embedded end to end, they own data, they own the research analysis, but they are all managed by central analytics group. So that way we can do the knowledge sharing. They, they become the evangelizer as well on any system that central analytics team creates. Um, but also they are the part of the product team, be able to um, you know, see the success. So Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. more or less the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how about, um, you know, data scientists is very interesting in a way of, used to be just about product team and engineering team. Mm -hmm. Now there's a scientist involved. Um, have you seen any cultural challenges or organizational challenges? <laughs> Um, yes. Um, so if you go back, kind of again decompose, going back a few steps to some of the things I've already said, um, we actually, I talk a lot about this notion of a data science value chain, right? So what I mean by that is, again, data science can't operate in a, in a vacuum, right? They are highly dependent upon a lot of other roles like data engineering. Um, they're even dependent upon the people who own the systems that are the originating generators of data, right? So that could be product managers of a website uh, and who own web logs. It could be um, people on a manufacturing line that drive sensor instrumentation for data capture, right? So there's a lot of dependencies that that data scientist has um, upstream as well as downstream if they actually want to take their models and get them put in production and drive real value creation for the organization. So um, this entering in of a new role is challenging and disruptive to existing um, prioritization and commitments and roadmaps and things like that. So. Um, that's usually um, a, one of the main reasons why we say that at the end of the day, um, the move to big data, especially by the enterprise sector, needs to be followed and accompanied with um, strong executive support um, because you need to drive the alignment into um, a lot of these existing roles so that um, there's, there's kind of an understanding that this is a key priority to begin to um, build the means by which the company is going to compete on the basis of data. Right, that's a very new thing for most companies. 
Do you have a data analyst team and scientist team separately, or do you? So we don't have analysts. We okay. just have data scientists. Um, and what we've actually just done is um, uh, merge them with best-in-class data engineers and architects. So my organization, Pivotal Data Labs, is a services organization um, that sits on top of the Pivotal software stack. And we help um, our customers with architecture um, as well as um, data science and, and model operationalization and things like that. Okay. And you guys fall under CTO umbrella? Um, I, my boss is Scott Yara, so I report to the R&D side of the house, yeah. All right, cool. Okay. Um, let's see. How about uh, any business use cases maybe you can share with us where machine learning data scientists were able to make an impact the business. Sure, yeah. Um, so we're actually seeing a lot of different, um, so my, the way that I've built out the data science team at Pivotal, we've actually built people um, to bring in expertise across many different verticals, as well as bringing in kind of horizontal problem solving areas of knowledge. So we have experts on our team that um, are passionate about graph modeling um, and natural language processing, uh, video and image related an analytics, um, not to mention experts in, um, you know, financial services, uh, healthcare, life sciences, uh, retail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we see use cases that span um, all of those sectors and um, potential problem solving approaches, which is really exciting because you actually bring all that knowledge together and actually you start beginning to then cultivate um, innovation and kind of um, new problem solving techniques. So kind of going back to a comment that Monica made in the earlier panel, um, the Internet of Things is just getting started uh, and it is going to be very vibrant. Um, and the creative, uh, the creativity that we're beginning to see in the manufacturing class, um, a sector that has not well known big data until now, um, is, is really compelling. Um, so one of the use cases came out of the life sciences place in the pharma, uh, and that was simply pulling um, logs, sensor logs off of their manufacturing line so that they could then predict um, the, in a vaccine the um, potency and the antigen levels of the vaccines that were coming off the manufacturing line. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect example. So we were able to do that with a high degree of accuracy, also bringing in some manual um, technician logs that we were running some natural language processing on. So that is exciting because it's a perfect example of where big data is heading. It's not all B2C centric, which a lot of people kind of um, uh, overly uh, default to in their thinking. Um, and the next big wave really is all hinged on the Internet of Things. Um, where beyond Google, you have players like GE, um, who's a 10% owner of Pivotal, that um, intend to play heavily in the Internet of Things space. Um, another one, just to show the creativity of, um, of both our customers and our team, is taking um, transactional data from credit cards used at gas stations, uh, and also bringing in wholesale gas um, pricing data to predict gas prices at the next day. Um, and that was saving about a million bucks a month for the company that we worked with. Um, so you, you get a sense for the fact that where data um, can be captured, and gen so generated and captured, brought into the right stack, um, the distributed compute stack, um, and then with the right uh, creativity and problem solving, um, a lot of un um, identified value can be unlocked um, for many, many companies across many sectors. Cool. I, I like to agree with that. I think at Zynga, it's more about gaming side, but um, uh, we've been focusing really around how to optimize games using personalization and machine learning, how to retain customers after a game has been built and launched. Uh, but the, the area that we are looking at right now is really around how to design a new game um, using simulative data, how to, um, you know, kind of create the design and the, uh, create the, the game that we, we think it's going to be the biggest game ever. Um, so that's the simulative data prediction before it even launches is something we're now looking at. That's cool. Yeah. Big emphasis on experimentation, I would imagine, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so going back to just a very quick um, 
we do a lot of A-B testing. We have about hundreds. I think we have 600 experiments running at all time for 20 games that we have. Um, the challenge, that, we, as we talked about, that we are facing right now is uh, we have PMs running A-B testing on their own, and they're deciding, this, making decision based on the A-B that they've run, the reports that they've seen. Now we are trying to automate that and machinalize it using machine learning to try to do the long-term optimization system. Um, there's a culture challenge there that we are seeing, <laughs> We're making good progress, but uh, something that we are definitely seeing is because of the data-driven culture that we build where all the PMs, everyone is looking at the data on a daily basis, how do we automate that and how do we get the trust from them to, to get the machine learning to the next level? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so whether you're, if you're building, um, you know, as entrepreneurs, if you're building a product that is really targeted at the enterprise sector and it's kind of, um, its essence is derived out of a big data kind of um, context, um, you have to go into um, that world eyes wide open um, in terms of the kind of both entrenched interests as well as um, actually the openness to disruption. So the thing that I would say that we're seeing at Pivotal as we um, do the work that we're doing is companies are really looking for um, help in unlocking that value. And as a result, they know that they kind of, um, the hypothesis is the value is there. Mm -hmm. um, and they need the help to actually extract the value, right? So that's of course the whole governing logic to Pivotal, which is helping companies um, revolve around kind of applications, data analytics, and kind of this virtuous cycle. Um, but I think um, as entrepreneurs, um, really understanding the dynamic and how data is being leveraged today, um, how the um, aspiration to unlock value on big data is definitely there, um, but going into it eyes wide open in terms of the challenges that it could bring and kind of Im embedding your, um, your um, product or your service or your um, vision um, is, is definitely an important um, kind of piece of advice. Cool. Okay. Uh, last question. Yep. How many data scientists do you have in your team again? <laughs> so we have about 40. 40 data scientists? Yep. So I'd like to close this by asking you what is your secret <laughs> <laughs> on hiring? I know it's just a hot market right now. How do yes. you, what do you do to <laughs> hire and retain your data scientists in your group? Um, so I guess I would, I, I would love to say that it's because of me <laughs> and my charm, um, but it's actually not. The first thing that I, I would say that it's kind of a, so first we've done a, we've been very lucky in that um, we've had a great culture um, that is very attractive to our candidates. Um, there's a couple things that are really important if you're trying to lure a data scientist, and that is that you want to A, um, show a true commitment to data um, you know, if uh, a, a, a true data scientist coming out of academia, passionate about problem solving and machine learning, um, is going to sniff out um, kind of faux data commitments pretty quickly, um, just like I would as somebody who comes from the data world. Um, you have to arm, you have to equip them, empower them with best in breed um, analytic tools. Um, so we're moving away from small data to big data. So giving somebody a laptop and telling them to go power um, uh, model building using R um, on a very heavily sampled set of data is not going to wing it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, really in thinking about your big data platform, um, arming, knowing, showing that data scientists that you're going to arm them with best-in-class um, analytic tools. Um, and giving them the, 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 the visibility, the spotlight on the work that they're doing. Um, those are the things that will naturally lure really great talent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.